Good morning, Grace Church, beautiful people. Glad you're here, online campus. Glad you're joining as well. Uh, my name is Jesse, and it's a joy to be one of the pastors of this church. We are going to be opening our Bibles to Matthew chapter 13 today. And so if you, so pull out your Bible, pull out your phone, turn to Matthew 13. If you want one of our house Bibles, our ushers are going to come down. Miss Patty, in particular, raise your hand. She'll hook you up with our house Bible. It's page uh, 478 in the house Bible. Again, Matthew 13. Uh, I've been married for 15 years in January to my amazing wife, Desiree. We have four young children, and uh, they create a lot of mess. When you walk into my home, you walk in the front door, you'll see on the wall in front of you a sign that says, pardon the mess, my children are making memories. If you have kids, you get it, right? It's amazing how quickly they can create a mess in our home. Uh, and so I was looking around the house trying to find and take a picture of the stereotypical mess that my kids make. And I found one, but you know what? I can't put the blame on my kids for this one. The mess that I found is the fault of my wife and I. And now this is a true confession, and I want anyone out there to, to confess with me by raising your hand. Do you have a drawer in your home that looks like this? This is our Tupperware drawer. Anybody? Anybody have a drawer like that? Thank you. Yes. Oh, it feels so good. Now, this Tupperware drawer, it is a hot mess, but it's also strategically placed because it's like perfectly built and designed. But if you take something out, it will become an avalanche and it all just falls out onto the kitchen floor. But really, it is a hot mess. It is like unstable. It is insecure and Sometimes life can feel like that, right? Life can feel like a mess. It can feel insecure. It can feel unstable. It can feel like at any moment it can all just fall apart. And the mess of life can cause us to become numb to joy. The mess of life can cause us to become numb to joy. Do you have joy in your life right now? Or do you feel like you're numb to joy? Do you have in your life right now what you need to have true and real lasting joy? Or do you not even know what it looks like or what it even means to have something significant that can cause real joy in your life? Again, the mess of life can make us numb to joy. Some, sometimes it's just the busyness of life. Work and your boss is just driving you like a slave driver or maybe family and kids and all of the activities that you have and, and school and just it feels overwhelming and stressful. Stress can make us numb to joy, can't it? Maybe it's comparison. We're like, man, I wish I could have that house like that person or that spouse like that person or those kids would be so much better than my kids or man, I wish I could have less kids in my life. That would be awesome. Just one less, Lord. Um, and so comparison or... Uh, you know, we're in the holidays. Holiday number one kind of came, and you're feeling tired already. Christmas decorations and the Christmas list of things to buy, and you're like, I don't know if I have enough money for it. And then I'm talking to family, and we're, you know, they're bringing up the vaccine and the booster and the masks, and that's messy. It's messy in my, in my family. Like, that can cause us to just feel tired and can make us numb to joy. There's a number of people at our church who I know personally, and I know others as well, who have experienced loss this year. And around the table, the, the, the dinner table, people that have been there are not there this year. And our, my family's experienced that. And so the loss can really cause us to become numb to joy. Another personal example, in the last couple of years, my family has been on the journey to foster foster adopt. And so um, in, in part of our goal and our reason is we want to be an example to you because we would love to start a foster ministry at Grace at some point down the future. Not, any, not right now. But our new lead pastor who's like, you know, he's almost there, uh, Josh and Amy, they um, adopted one of their daughters. And it's in their heart to create a ministry. And there's a number of amazing Families at our church that have a real heart because God's heart is for the poor and the widow and the orphan and the migrant. And, and so, uh, so in the last number of months, we've met one of these amazing families. 
that go to grace. And they're empty nesters, and they just have a heart for fostering kids in San Diego. And so they're, they've been fostering this little girl since January. And we've had the joy to get to know them, and they joined our small group. And a few months ago, they said, hey, she's potentially going up for adoption. Would you want to put your home study in? And we said yes. And so we put our home study in with the social worker, and we got people from our church praying for us, and we're like hoping, and just this story just seems like such an amazing story. I mean, the couple from this church, and we met them, and I could just, it would be amazing. So we're praying for it, and we found out last week that we didn't get selected. And there's grief, and there's loss, and heartbreak, and all those different things. And um, in the last year, this is the sixth time that we've put our home study in for a daughter, or to foster a girl, and it hasn't worked out. And I can even feel, even again from this one, even in my own heart, just this numbness, like it's never going to happen. And like the joy of the possibility of it, just kind of feel like, is it ever going to happen, Lord, right? The mess of life and just the lack of control can really cause, a pers- cause us to become numb to true joy. And so this series is called Thankful Mess. How do we have thankfulness in the midst of the mess of life? Two weeks ago, Pastor Scott talked about finding contentment in the midst of trials. Last week, Pastor Dan talked about thankfulness in the midst of circumstances. And today's message is called the end of joy. The end of joy. And I'm using the word end intentionally because end can mean like the loss of joy or like you don't have it. It's gone, right? That's one way to understand it. But there's another way to understand end, the word end. And it's like the goal, the end, the thing that you're shooting for. You see, uh, the Greek word telos means end. And in philosophical circles and kind of thinkers, they, they'll, they'll use the word telos as the goal, the object that your life is pointing towards, the thing that you're attached to. That's ca- it's kind of like the ends justify the means. That's another way to understand an end. So an illustration to help hopefully make this even more sense, uh, in sailing, I'm not a sailing guy, never, I've been on a sailboat, but I don't know what, what it, anything about sailing. But there's a difference between a rope and a line in sailing, from what I've read. Now, a rope on a sailboat is just a rope. It's not attached to anything. It's a rope that's just chilling somewhere on the boat. Now, a line is different. On a sailboat, a line is actually attached to something. It has a purpose. There's something that this rope that's attached called a line has something intended, has a purpose for it. And you see, in life, what we are attached to, the end, what we're tethered to really, really matters. You see, we can have joy in the mess of today because we are tethered, we're attached to a glorious end. We're attached to a glorious end. And so I want us to turn to Matthew 13 to unpack this. Jesus is teaching crowds of people. And he teaches seven different parables in Matthew chapter 13. Now parables are these simple stories that made sense to the listener uh, that had a twist to elicit some sort of reaction or response. Uh, And so most of these parables are about farming because it's an agrarian culture and society. And so... um, Basically, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, I'm going to summarize it, is the parable of the weeds. And there, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes and scatters seed. And then he goes to bed. And then an enemy comes in and scatters weeds among the seeds at night. And the servants of the house uh, recognize the weed seeds. Uh, <laughs> I imagine that's how it's in my head. And they go to the master and they're like, what do you want us to do? And the master says, just let them grow both sets, and then at harvest time, we will harvest, separate them, and one will be put in the barn, and the other will be burnt. Now, later on, after he's done teaching the crowds, uh, the disciples say, Jesus, we don't get it. What do you mean by the parable of the weeds? And so they ask him to explain it. Now, I'm going to read this text. It is heavy. It is intense. Jesus' words Um, can be heavy, but I want to invite you to seek to understand, to not be freaked out, but to say, God, what do you, what do you want me to understand, and how do you want me to respond? In verse 36, then Jesus left the crowds, and he went into the house, 
And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. So Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the, as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Again, this is heavy. And we don't often talk about such topics of like heaven and hell. And we try and avoid them because they kind of freak us out. But man, it is so important to understand what Jesus is teaching. And he teaches about this topic on a regular basis. So we need to unpack it. So what is Jesus saying? There's weeds and there's grain. And they represent two different kinds of people. One are the sons of the kingdom of our heavenly father. And the other are sons and daughters of the evil one. Both are sons and daughters. It's just like the firstborn son and the identity in that. So we don't need to get there. But one is planted by the devil and the other planted by Jesus. So you may be asking, and you should be asking, how do I get planted by Jesus? We're going to get to that in a little bit. Twice, Jesus uses the phrase, the end of the age. You see, we currently live in an age, a time period. But this time period will come to an end. And there will be a new age to come after that. You see, there's um, a theological term called eschatology. Can you all say eschatology? Eschatology, get it up. Eschaton is uh, the word for the last things, kind of the future. So it's the study of the future. I think it's really cool, and I teach my kids this, that we know the future. I think that's cool. We don't know everything, for sure. There's a lot of mystery. But there are things that God has told us about what is to come in the future that I think is super cool. And so Jesus is going to return a second time. He came one time. 2,000 years ago, that's why we celebrate Christmas. He will come again. We don't know when in the future. And at that time of his second coming, according to this parable, angels are going to separate these two different groups of people, the righteous and the, the unrighteous, the sinners. And so you may want to ask yourself and have clarity on this question. How do I become righteous? Yeah? That seems like an important question to have answered. We're going to answer it later. Um, Jesus continues just to get real in this, pa in this parable. There are two different ends. There are two different telos that Jesus is communicating to us. One is an end with a fiery furnace. And so I want to get two different pieces of rope and not hurt myself. But according to Jesus, we all are attached to one end or the other. One is a direction of the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The other is the kingdom of the heaven of our Father where the sons and daughters will shine like the glory of the sun, I think. Um, it really matters which one a person is attached to. Whether you believe it or not, you are invited to wrestle with this. And according to Jesus, you have an end and it will be one of these two places. You may be wondering, Jesse, this message is about joy. <laughs> this is a little bit of a downer. Why are we talking about this heavy, heavy topic? Because I know it's heavy, but in it is the source of true joy. In it is the source of true joy because I deeply believe that until you know what you have been saved from, you cannot have joy that you will never be there. I want to say it again. Until you understand what you have been saved from, you cannot have joy that you will never be there. Let me give you an example. Last year, I had a root canal to fix. No, I had to fix a root canal. It was awful. So the dentist is like, you need to fix this thing, and insurance doesn't cover it. It's going to be $5,000. <sighs> Surgery, all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, is there any way to save money? I'm a pastor. I've got four kids. 
They're like, you can get the local anesthesia instead of the put you to sleep. And you'll save $800. I'm like, 800 bucks? Absolutely. I won't feel it. You'll kind of numb me all up in there. Sure, let's do it. It was awful. It was excruciating. It was the worst. Now, imagine the dentist comes up to me and says, before the surgery, and, and, but I know I've experienced the surgery, and so I know what it's like. Uh, and he's like, you know what? We switched the x-rays. It's the dude next door that needs to get the root canal fixed. You're good. Just floss a little bit better. I would give that dentist a hug and kiss and be like, thank you, because I don't have to spend that money and experience that excruciating pain. And in a similar way, when, when you understand the gift of the grace of God, of salvation for your life, it changes everything where we are today. There's a, 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 a theologian from the 19th century named Charles Spurgeon. This guy just cranks out the quotes. I mean, just amazing. One of his quotes is, he says, you will find all true theology summed up in two short sentences. Salvation is all of the grace of God. Damnation is all the will of men. It seems like, you know, turn or burn and kind of fire and brimstone. But I want us just to understand theologically and then even personally what, what is happening here. You see, we are all weeds. We are all unrighteous. It's easy for me to admit. <laughs> lots of unrighteousness, right? I've made lots of mistakes and continue to. I, I am a sinner. And we are destined because of that to eternal separation from God. Every single one of us. Now, God loves every single person, desires none to perish, but all to have eternal life, the whole world. And so, and so God has done everything necessary for us to, to, to not be a weed. God doesn't send anyone to hell. I want to, us to wrestle with this, right, and us to consider this, and I want to be careful, but I believe that God doesn't send anyone to hell. You see, God has been proactive to do everything necessary for no person to go. But when we reject God, when a person rejects God, when a person says, God, I don't want you in my life, I don't want the good news and the gift of salvation, God just simply says, if that's what you want, I'm going to give it to you. If you want me, you can have me. You don't have to work for it, you just get me and the forgiveness I have for you. But if you don't, I'm going to let you have what you want. One, and it breaks God's heart and doesn't want anyone to perish. God loves you and is for you. Um, all seven parables, if you look at all seven and you read them, they all talk about this reality called the kingdom of heaven. All seven parables, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven in all of them. The kingdom of heaven is a very important concept for you and I to understand. And each parable helps us to get a little bit more clarity and a little bit more insight of what the kingdom of heaven is, how it operates, and how it is this eternal reality. You see, our current reality in this world is temporary. It is temporary. And so if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, at that moment that that belief and that faith happens, you become born into the kingdom of heaven, into the family of God, and you you're, you will live for eternity with God. Martin Lloyd Jones, a 20th century theologian, says this The moment a man or woman realizes that he or she is only a pilgrim in this world, that he has to die and to face God, and that there is all eternity before him, his whole outlook on life changes. Have you gotten to that point where you've awakened to this truth? from God, that you will exist for eternity? Have you come to the point to realize one day you will stand before God? And if that brings even the slightest amount of fear into your heart, I want you to know that there is good news for every single person. That the image of God that you have should not be on that day fear. It really should not be if you have received God and his salvation. It should be God. You are just going to embrace me and wipe away every tear. That is your future destination. Because Jesus, who knew no sin, on the cross became sin so that you can become the righteousness of God. There's this exchange that happens when you believe in Christ and his work on the cross. You become the righteousness of God. Everything you've done and have or will ever do, 
you become righteous before God. The end of true and real joy, according to Jesus, is found here, and it's summarized in the next two parables. So I want to read the next two parables as Jesus helps us understand the source of true joy. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found, and then he covered it back up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now this guy is just kind of walking around, not really looking for anything, just kind of twiddling his thumbs, and then he kind of finds some a corner of a treasure chest, and he's like, oh dang, cover that thing back up, go run, liquidate all you have, and he buys this field, and he, has, he knows what he's found, and he has so much joy in what he's discovered unintentionally. Now the second parable Our third parable, verse 45, says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, and who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So now this second person is a merchant of like fine jewels, and is in search, is seeking and hunting out this, uh, the most precious jewel that they can find. And they know what it looks like. And as soon as they find it, like, I'm going to liquidate all other pearls, all other jewels, because this one is the most in, important thing. Now, these two parables are illustrating different ways that we discover Christ and fall in love with him and fall in love with the kingdom and the reality of how the kingdom of God works today and into eternity. Some people just kind of stumble upon it. And today, even right now, God may be awakening in some of us and just kind of stumbling into the, the beautiful, amazing treasure of the kingdom of heaven and God just opening up your mind to it. And some of you, it's been strategic. You've been looking for it and you've found it and I want to ask you a hypothetical question to see if you get it, if it's real or you. Imagine I have two different things in my hand. One of them is the California lottery winning ticket. I checked it out. $203 million in my hand. It's the winning one. The other one is the kingdom of heaven. It's the gift of the kingdom of heaven. You can have one, not both, and you choose right now. Come forward. You can come grab one. Everyone stand up. Just kidding. (laughs) Which one would you choose? Imagine what you can buy with $203 million. Jared, you could get that house, bro. I know. I know you want one. Uh, You could, I mean, imagine what you could buy with that. I mean, your wildest dreams, but this should bother you. This is not hypothetical. This is, uh, this can be a real thing to help us understand. Do we truly value what Jesus wants us to value? Because Jesus says, what good is it? For a person to gain the whole world, all that the world can offer, and lose or forfeit our soul. You see, what is truly valuable, what is worthy of joy just bubbling up from within your heart, the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything. Do you have it? And it is it causing, eliciting joy in your heart. Now, I want to give just a few practical points from these parables. Three points. Takeaways. The end of joy comes when you see what is truly valuable. And I guess this is repetitious, but whatever. The end of joy comes when you see what is truly valuable. Um, Our family has experienced loss. So a couple, three months ago, my stepbrother, Desiree's brother, my wife, he passed away. Um, Unexpected, and and we're, you know, processing as a family in a couple weeks— uh, is his service up in Central Coast, and I'm going to officiate the celebration of life. And um, one of the things that I do in these moments is help the listener, the people there, just kind of think about their telos. I help them wrestle with their own end and, and, and consider where their future destiny is going for the people there. You see, it's a sad time. It's a time of grief. It's a time of mourning. And we're not pretending to be happy when we're sad. We're not, this is not just, hey, put a smile on your face when things are really hard. No, that is not it. It is that joy, can, real joy can be found even in the midst of the mess and the heart tragedies and the sadness of life when we understand what is truly valuable in the midst of it and we can celebrate with authenticity those things. 
The second end of joy comes when you give your whole life to it. Both people sold all of their possessions and, and, and bought the kingdom of heaven, this gift. Now, what does that mean for you? What does it look like for you to like sell all your possessions? So go home, liquidate it all, and then give it away. <laughs> no. <laughs> but really, what does that look like for you? I think a, a helpful parallel, at least in my head, um, when I stood at the altar and told my wife that I love her, and I'm committing my life to her. I told her that she is the, will be the only one for me for the rest of my life. There will be no others. She is the only single one. Everything else I'm, se- I'm giving, giving away to her. And, and that can feel constricting, right? Like, oh, one person? What's up with that? Like, and, but to me, and what I have experienced in 15 years, it is, it is freedom. It is where the source of joy is found. You know Why? Because I'm not attached to any other person, any other woman. I'm not, like the option is off the table. I don't even, it's just not even, a, it's closed. Does that make sense? It's, it's not an option. And so I'm free to choose her and her alone. And in a similar way, when you've given all of it to God and you don't need anything from this world, you're detached from all the things and the needs of this world, whether it's the, pr- the approval of people or you know, like a fancy bank account or whatever it is. When you're like, I don't need any of it, God. It's all yours. May your will be done, whether I have little or a lot. You become detached, and so you become free from all of it. And you can truly receive the joy in its place. The third, the end of joy comes when you receive the price, his priceless gift. You see, you can't create it. You didn't make it in the parables. They discover it and receive it, right? It, it, it is from God and from God alone. There's little gifts all around us. Every breath that we breathe is a gift, right? Every meal that we get to eat is a reminder of God's provision. Every interaction and love and, and all those are gifts from God. But, but really the, the one source of the gift from God is the gift of salvation, and I love the way King David puts it in Psalm 51, 12. King David has just been caught. Caught murdering a dude who his wife, hey, okay, let's see if I can get this right. First, he sleeps with a lady who's married, basically the R word. Um, and then he kills her husband. I mean, that's bad. I don't know how bad you've been, but that's pretty bad. And he gets caught. And he's just confessing before God, right? He's just broken before God. He says, God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. God, I've tasted it, I've experienced it, but I just, I need to be reminded this is your salvation, the gift that you, that you can give to me. How do you have joy in the mess of life? Maybe your family's great, maybe it's not. Maybe your health is great, maybe it's not. Maybe you have, your finances are doing great, or it's not. You feel alone, or maybe you wish you could have a little bit more alone time. (laughs) Joy comes from being tethered and attached to the simple gospel. And so, in closing, I want to close with one scripture that I just love. John 1, 12 says, To all who did receive him, this is Jesus, whoever believes in his name, in the name of Jesus, he has given the right... I love that word. He has been given the right to become children of God. You can claim this right. When you believe and when you receive him, you have the right. You can claim it. This is my right. You don't, God does not give us the right to very many things. Did you know that? You don't ha- God doesn't give you the right to like health. God doesn't give you the right to have a, like, the be- like an incredible family. God doesn't give you a right to not suffer. This is a right that God has given you to hold on to with all of your heart, no matter what you are going through. The right to claim that you are a child of God when you believe in him, when you receive him. And so in response, we're going to enter into a time of worship. And I hope that, that God is just building and, and giving us the gift of joy in our hearts for the gift of salvation, the simple gospel. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you that you are for us and not against us. God, thank you that you do not stand back with your arms crossed, judge in this seat, kind of like waiting to just make us feel awful and shameful. God, that is not who you are. God, may you replace in us anything that is contradictory to who you truly are. God, you are our heavenly Father who is proactive, who sent your Son to do everything necessary. It cost you everything. God, there is no extent you wouldn't go to to, for, for your love and the needed forgiveness to be claimed over our lives. God, thank you for that. The extent of your love that you demonstrated and that is still true today. God, may you awaken joy just for who you are and what you've done. God, if there's anyone here who has never received and believed in you, Jesus, and they know it and you know it, and there's, God, you're awakening and giving them an authentic, real desire to be forgiven for their shame and their guilt to be buried in the, at the foot of the cross, to be your son, daughter, born into the family of God, to be with you in your kingdom for forever and ever, God, for that person in the quietness of your own heart, just say, God, I believe you. I receive you right now. God, I am sorry for rejecting you, for saying no to you, to not welcoming you. All the things I've done, God, forgive me. Thank you that you make me right. Thank you, God, for everything I have or will ever do. God, thank you you love me and teach me what it means to love you with all of my heart and my mind and my soul and my strength. And God, for anyone here who has all, already has this eternal treasure, this pearl of great price, God, may even right now as we stand to worship you, fill us with the joy of your salvation. May we rejoice in the simple gospel. It's more than we could ever deserve. 